I would request Honorable Miss Justice Barbara Zobak, Judge Supreme Court, Slovenia, to kindly express her views on global citizenship education. Hello? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear students, dear friends, I hope you are all doing well and most of all that you are staying healthy. Let me express my gratitude to the City Monster School, School Lucknow for organizing this event and many thanks to everybody for joining us. At first glance, the term global citizenship education sounds contradictory. The citizenship education is usually defined as an education that provides the background knowledge necessary to provide a basic foundation of civic knowledge representing the minimum one may need to know to participate in society. The citizenship education aims at creation of a civilized society. Since societies are divided into different states, different nations, ethnic groups, religions, the concept of global citizenship education sounds illusory. As global citizenship does not exist so far, also global citizenship education is hard to be brought into life. In general, people always perceive citizenship as a tool of differentiation and the means which helps in building a feeling of belonging, but of which flip side is the feeling of exclusion and separation in relation to the others non-citizens. When speaking of certain citizenship, we always connect it with exclusion of all others, namely of non-citizens. Citizenship thus recognizes and constitutes itself through differing from others and exclusion of all non-citizens. However, such an approach stands in striking contrast with reality. Globalization, if we like it or not, has long become an inevitable fact. The world is getting connected as never before. Nations and societies are intertwined and interdependent, not only in terms of trade and economic interests, but also in communication, travel, science, which could only progress globally. Migration, international students exchange, and the last, but not the least, as we are currently experiencing in combating the global evil personified in the novel coronavirus pandemic. Hence, the term of the former individualistic and exclusivist position has become urgent, unavoidable, and inescapable. Exclusion should be replaced by inclusion, individualistic approach should be combined and attenuated with the communal one. The set claim holds all the more for small nations and tiny countries like Slovakia, Suriname, which representative virtually sits here next to me. And the nature and the context uh, of citizenship education varies across countries. Despite wide variation, programs uh, tend in general to cohere around a number of focal points. Besides topics connected with national states, its uh, identity, history, constitution, and the legal structure of the respective countries, citizen education also involves global education as global literacy action. The latter stems uh, from worries uh, of the mentioned interconnectedness and interdependency of the contemporary world. The more complex and sophisticated the nowadays societies are, the more they depend on each other. 
as individual cannot survive alone, also societies cannot develop and progress and pursue their goals in isolation. The smaller they are, the more globally dependent they are. For example, Slovenians have learned that well from our experiences. That's why nations and states are cooperating, form alliances, unities, and other international and supranational associations. Hence, each citizenship education, education, even for the bare pragmatic uh, reasons, needs an overarching, uh, overarching concept that goes beyond nation state and provides unity and coherence to several related fields, including development education, environmental education, cross-cultural understanding, human rights uh, education, and peace education. It is like a steel-made umbrella shielding from the hell of misunderstanding, fear and hatred between different society, nations, races, and religions. Let me conclude with an example taken from my last uh, year experience. When uh, my husband and I arrived in Delhi, since I have never been in India before, we decided to sightsee some places in your amazing capital city. We took a taxi and asked the driver to take us to some of myriads of Delhi's uh, highlights. He was Hindu, an everyman, a simple person, entirely self-educated without any formal education, who never traveled abroad. But he spoke considerable good English. He had learned it himself. He led us to the Sikh temple and saw it all strictly following the Sikh temple protocol. He demonstrated his deep respect to the Sikh religion, to the worshippers. He respectfully stood in the line, slowly approaching Guru, both humbly and placing a banknote offering respectfully before the Guru. Then, uh, during the trip, he is explained his approach to Indian religious diversity as different paths to one some God. Paths take slightly different, mostly due to different cultural tradition and historical reasons, but based on the same fundamental values and principles all emanating from the respect to human dignity. That's why he truly respects all religions. A simple Indian everyman demonstrated all three core conceptual dimensions of global citizenship education as proposed by UNESCO. Cognitive, socio-emotional, and behavioral. He gave us a good practical lesson of global citizenship education. Thank you very much. We request Justice Anand Kumar Charan to please start with his address. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Sandeep sir. Excellencies, Honorable judges, attorneys, attorneys and students, the organizers of the conference, ladies and gentlemen, and in short, skipping protocol, everybody listening to my speech. First of all, a special good day rest to all of you. I don't know which part of the day it is in your country, so I say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and also good night. Namaste, kaiseho up, which means greetings. How are you? As a representative of the Court of Justice of the Republic of Suriname, it is a special honor and a privilege to participate in this conference. 
I think it is the seventh time that our Court of Justice is participating in this conference. And I must say it is still a pleasure doing so. It is a special feeling for me to participate in this conference organized by citizens of a country where my ancestors came from a long time ago when they, they left their hometown for another country called Suriname. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have to communicate in this manner, but I think we have no other choice under these circumstances. Still, I have to say, be safe and stay safe, everybody. I want to take the opportunity to compliment the organizers of this conference in general for their efforts to organize the conference, notwithstanding the COVID-19 pandemic. In particular, I want to thank Dr. Jagdish Gandhi and his family, Dr. Bharti Gandhi and uh, Gita Gandhi Kingdom, for their great contribution to the conference throughout the past years. And his sincere personality, as I have experienced when I was in Lucknow. Also, I want to thank Professor Sandeep Srivastava, in particular, for his great skills and experience in organizing this conference year after year. Sandeep sir is also a great host when we are in Lucknow, and his charming personality is also a great pleasure in interacting with him. He also resembles a Bollywood actor, in my opinion, and I therefore used to call him Rajnikant with his sunglasses. <laughs> Regarding the topic of this session, global citizenship education, I can say the following, following words. My personal opinion is that the world no longer exists of separate countries, but due to globalization, it has become one big world where the countries should cooperate and help each other in overcoming the daily problems which they have in common and find structural solutions for these problems instead of fighting each other. So I think each country should try to empower the idea of global citizenship education. Our scope should, not, should no longer be limited to only to our own country, but we have to think beyond borders because we need other countries also to access as a country in this world. I just mentioned some reasons, international trade between countries, migration of the inhabitants, tourism, nowadays it's limited according to the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change due to global warming. I realize that, that, is, that this is a process that will take some time. I think there is a long way to go, but once a start is made and we are aware of the situation, we will urge ourselves to make the mind shift and come with solutions on a short term. The judiciary of every nation must not only be the establisher of the rule of law, but must also stand for education of the people and as much as possible bring peace, first into their very own community and then global. The judiciary must and can have an impact on educating the citizens of, in, of every nation. In fact, Every judge is called for this job. An international agreement regarding this matter shall in the end probably determine this matter. But for the time being, I think that the judiciary must take his responsibility. Sometimes the judiciary take the lead when the executive and the legislative fall asleep. And the judiciary gave signals in their decisions which are meant to be the so-called wake-up calls for the executive or the legislative. Further on, the chief justices of various countries can deliberate and cooperate with each other about the matters regarding the implementation of an international agreement on global citizenship education. The executive and the legislative powers also have an important role to play in the implementation of agreements or laws regarding global citizenship education. In my opinion, the schools of a country can play a very important role in global citizenship education by educating the students to also think beyond borders and by emphasizing the importance of a global conception. The teachers of the schools can thereby play a key role in this concept. I personally think that the City Montessori School can be set as an example for the rest of the world and maybe they can help the schools in incorporating this topic as a part of their curriculum. 
the press media has in my opinion also a great responsibility regarding this issue they are the so-called fourth power beside the judiciary the legislative and the executive they are called the, the eyes and ears of the community and they can have a great impact on making the mind shift needed for this global issue i can't resist quoting bapu mahatma gandhi at the end of my speech he said happiness is when what you think what you say and what you do are in harmony i think it is important to keep this quote in mind i wish you all a good a fruitful conference thank you very much for your attention and may god bless you all namaste and jai jagat thank you i would request uh, ms angelica rosha ponce attorney in the ministry of bolivia to kindly uh, let us uh, hear the address please namaste thank you so much for the invitation it is an honor to me for me to participate in this big and important conference i personally want to thank to dr gadish gandhi dr barty gandhi professor sandeep sri vastava and all the cmn staff to make this conference possible The topic theme of global citizen education is very important and transcendental due to its impact worldwide. Um at a time when the international community is urged to define actions to promote peace, well-being, prosperity and sustainability, this concept ensures that learners of all ages and backgrounds can develop into informed crit- critically literate socially connected ethical and engaged global citizens historically citizenship did not extend to all for example only men and property owners were eligible to be citizens During this past century there has been a gradual movement towards a more inclusive understanding of citizenship influenced by the development of civil political and social rights um current current perspectives or on national citizenship vary between countries reflecting difference in political and historical context among other factors an increasingly globalized world has raised questions about what constitutes meaningful citizenship and well as about its global dimensions education for global citizens uh, citizenships help young people develop the core competence which allows them to actively engage with the world that we live and help to make it more just and a sustainable place that is very important to take in mind global citizenship nurtures personal respect and respect for others wherever they live it doesn't matter the region the country uh, the borders um it encourages individual to to think deeply and critically about what is equitable and just and what will minimize the harm to our planet a global citizen citizen is someone who is aware and who is aware of and understands the wider world and their place in it they take an active role in their community and work with others to make our planner more peaceful more sustainable and more fairer most important global citizen helps global citizenship helps young people to build their own understanding of world events um citizenship have rights within the state sometimes inscribed the most of the times inscribed in in a constitution which is the case of my country bolivia as well as obligations under the law naturally global citizenship transcends political borders that is important to take into account uh, because assumes that responsibilities and rights can be derived from a being from being a citizen of the world not especially not a specific country 
every person, every person is responsible for the world in which she or he lives and in, in which our children will grow. So protecting the environment, promoting solidarity, taking an active part in building tomorrow world are core challenges for action taken. Very important. Answering the means working on three different levels. First level, persevering the environment and developing education to natural resource management, capacity building of civil society, particularly in young people, in, young, in youth groups, and recreating social links in society through space and time. If we can construct these three levels at this particular moment in history, especially in a post-COVID world, we will achieve a better world for tomorrow. Namaste, I thank you so much for this opportunity. I would like to invite Ms. Andrea thank you all. Asin, Vice Rector, International Relation, University of Concepcion del Uruguay, Argentina. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, Sandeep. Good night, everyone there in India, and good afternoon here in Argentina and also in Bolivia. <laughs> Opportunity to be here with you today, giving continuity to the bond that the University of Concepcion del Uruguay and the City Montessori School of Lugno have, and promoted the fundamental value of education for peace. I want to thank especially Dr. Sandeep Srivastava, my friend, for the invitation to this important event and above all for the permanent dialogue to try to generate joint activities that promote the internationalization of both institutions. We, uh, I would also like to greet especially Dr. Shekdish Gandhi and Dr. Lee Rossi, who is a prominent teacher of our House of Studies. In a context of pandemic, like the one we are living nowadays, our commitment to educational training and the exercise of new technologies for learning should aim their goal towards the future. The question that set the course of, uh, for this panel, this session, are concrete challenges for us who work in internationalization. It could be able to um, universities to promote a global and inclusive view. For example, when we ask ourselves if education helps global citizenship to tackle global problems, I would like to introduce the concept of educating for peace. At this point, the notion of education for peace was promoted by the United Nations with the purpose of training new generation in a culture of peace that allow men to resolve conflicts, uh, human, uh, humankind, for dialogue, mutual, uh, mutual understanding, and to value diversity. As educators, we need our students to become familiar with the notion of education for peace, and the words work for peace and the peacefully and the peaceful, sorry, resolution of conflict. Education for peace does not seek to suppress conflict as an inherent aspect uh, of social relation, but its purpose to engage citizens in the peaceful resolution of this situation through dialogy. At the same uh, time, this, this perspective supports there is only peace when there is justice. We are convinced uh, that it's essential to build a solid foundation from institution in general and educational institution in particular to educate for peace. The wafer of violence shake the most involved societies and move and dismay everyone. For this reason, we understand that educating for peace is an, an, an efficient a starting point that transcends cultures and geographical limits. We also wonder how can we teach youth 
and adults respect for diversity, justice, empathy, compassion, and the abandonment of pre uh, prejudice, values at the heart of global citizenship? How can schools best instill concern and commitment to contemporary global issues? Universities are part of social institutions and they play a fundamental role in the transformation of societies. By transmitting the international intellectual knowledge indispensable for the modernization and democratization of society, providing the schemes and values to ensure social stability and assisting the serving communities in solving complex problems. Associated with their development and well-being, these individuals will be part of the professional integration process and will influence social organizations. Universities are responsible for planning and executing higher level educational programs for the training of human resources and for the production and distribution of scientific, technological and cultural knowledge, which must pursue academic excellence and the training of university students committed to the society so that through their professional performance that contribute to the achievement of a more prosperous, freer and fairer society. Universities should guide the academic activities to development of objective and critical awareness of students. And uh, aforementioned uh, regarding the reality that society lives. But also uh, we have to establish the responsibility of the individuality in front of it. Other questions are how to develop a concern for sustainable development and all that it implies, including the reduction of materialism and consumerism, responsible consumption and reduction of needs. How to develop awareness and, proactive, uh, and proactivity towards the need to reform the global governance structure? How can global uh, citizenship education help students acquire an individual, national, and global identi identity and, pers and perspective? I would like to think here in terms of learning rather than education learning as an integral development of the person. The idea is that from the development of, of this learning, they will become full citizens. This has to do with the ability um, to undertake a project, a responsibility citizenship. To undertake uh, is, an, uh, is an attitude to undertake learning today, learning is set out on experience, to the experiences that each one can develop. This is important to link to the knowledge acquired in the classrooms, to see the practical correlation between what has been learned at the application of it in our life, of course. Knowing how to do from a multicultural perspective um, it exists the, the urge not to adapt antagonistic, uh, antagonistic position, but be broad. As the French uh, philosopher Edgar Morin said, teaching must once again become a task of public salvation, a mission. What does society demand? of university. Basically, a scientific uh, answer to crucial questions like poverty, malnutrition, the school drop off, drop out. From the universities, we have fundamental role to fulfill because we have to provide instruments for social transformation. And this will be possible as long as we are reassume our anticipatory role to continue being agents of change. The primary goal of world citizenship education is to uh, nurture respect for all, building a sense of belonging to a common humanity 
and helping students become active and responsible global citizens. It seeks to empower students to assume active uh, roles and face or uh, solve global challenges, becoming active contributors to the more peaceful, tolerant, inclusive and safe world. Global citizenship education helps young people develop their basic competencies, which allow them to actively connect with the world and help make it a fairer and more sensible place. It is a form of civic learning that involves the active participation of a student in projects that address global problems of a social, political, economic, and environmental nature. nature. Education must fully assume its central role in helping people to form fairer, more peaceful, tolerant, and inclusive societies. According to the United Nations, Global citizenship education provides the understanding, skills, and values that the students need to cooperate in solving the interconnected challenge of the 21th century. That is why those of us who, who work in the internalization um, of our university should strongly, uh, strongly commit, uh, build bridges, and promote collaborative work networks between partners from different countries to help complement the views and make internationalization a transversal function to all the disciplinary areas. Finally, I have you, um, I, I, I want to leave you a phrase, a phrase from Henry Ford that I really like for this team spirit. Coming together is the beginning keeping together is progress, working together is success. Thank you very much for your kind attention. A warm greeting for Argentina to all of you. Thank you very much, Andrea. I would like to tell you that uh, Andrea and me, we belong to the same university in Entre Rios province, but it's about 300 kilometers from Buenos Aires north to Buenos Aires. Uh, and in the opportunity that uh, Dr. Shadish Kandi was in Argentina, uh, we invited him to visit the university in Entre Rios province. Uh, he graciously with uh, Sandip Sirivastava, they both went to Entre Rios uh, and have wonderful meetings with the students there. Now, yes, we have uh, Fernando Leon from Ecuador um, uh, our academy uh, has a strong relationship with the judges of Ecuador, and it is um, a real pleasure to introduce you to uh, Judge Fernando Leon. Por favor, Fernando, adelante. Could you stop this video, please? This video is not in the program. Justice is, Fernando Leon is about to speak. It is in the program, but he wants to say something. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. Good night, my friends. My name is Fernando Leon. My country is Ecuador, South America. I am provincial hood of the judicial of Ecuador. I speak Spanish. Thank Dr. Sandit, thank Dr. Hadis Gandhi. Thank you for watching me bit. Many blessings. Now we can start his video. Provincial judge from the Republic of Ecuador. En este planeta todos dependemos unos del otro y nada de lo que hagamos o dejamos de hacer es ajeno al destino de los demás. Sigmund Bauman, sociólogo polaco. Amigas y amigos, soy Fernando León Quinde, juez de la Corte de Justicia de la República del Ecuador, un país ubicado en el centro del mundo, en Sudamérica, de aproximadamente 16 millones de habitantes. Es megadiverso, multietnico y plurinacional. Es un verdadero honor para mí 
tener la oportunidad de dirigirme a todos ustedes en esta importante vigésima primera conferencia mundial por la paz y la justicia organizada por la brillante Escuela de Montessori, Lucno India. El mundo actual en que vivimos nos plantea importantes retos y desafíos que atañen a la humanidad en general, que deben en forma necesaria ser abordados no solo por los actores nacionales, sino a nivel global, es decir, de todos los habitantes de la Tierra. Esto implica necesariamente que la ciudadanía pueda llegar a entenderse desde una dimensión global para enfrentar juntos de mejor forma los desafíos generales del presente siglo. Se puede observar que en el siglo XXI se ha dado un vertiginoso avance en la tecnología, lo que ha permitido acercarse cada vez más a las personas por asuntos de familia, estudios, negocios, etc. Es que la educación para una ciudadanía global nace como un enfoque mismo en la educación para poder darse oportunidades y competencias y enfrentar los desafíos que implica vivir en una sociedad globalizada e interconectada, en la que en forma necesaria se debe adquirir conocimientos que lleven nuevas formas de pensar y actuar en temas ecológicos, sociales, políticos, culturales, etc., como lo ha considerado la UNESCO, lo que implica en sí la educación para el desarrollo, educación en derechos humanos, educación para la sustentabilidad, educación para la paz, educación intercultural, etc., con el fin de lograrse un mundo mejor, en el que impere la justicia, la fraternidad, la equidad, la solidaridad e igualdad para todos, donde no haya fronteras, sino seres humanos iguales en la diversidad. Se ha considerado que entre las oportunidades y competencias promovidas en los enfoques educacionales, la interculturalidad por medio del aprendizaje y diálogo es un aspecto muy importante, lo que permite interrelacionarse, conocerse y asimilarse a través de experiencia por medio de intercambio cultural, nuevas realidades y formas de vivir. Desde este marco de referencia, la UNESCO activamente promueve iniciativas con miras a la formación de ciudadanos del mundo, la llamada a la educación ante todo, o un Global Education First Initiative es una de ellas y ha sido clave en la promoción de una educación de calidad pertinente y transformadora para todos de cara a la dimensión educacional desde los fines del desarrollo del milenio. Para ello se ha propuesto avanzar en tres ámbitos prioritarios. A. Escolarizar a todos los niños y niñas del mundo. B. Mejorar la calidad del aprendizaje y se fomenta la conciencia de ser ciudadanos del mundo. Es una iniciativa también de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas para fomentar la conciencia de ser ciudadanos del mundo. Se deben enseñar valores, conocimientos y competencias necesarias para la paz, la tolerancia y el respeto de la diversidad. Cultivar un sentimiento de comunidad y de participación activa para devolver lo recibido a la sociedad y velar porque las escuelas estén exentes de todas formas de discriminación, incluidas las desigualdades entre los sexos, la intimidación, la violencia, la xenofobia de explotación. Una educación para la ciudadanía global que fomente la justicia social y abrir las mentes y los corazones de los niños, niñas, jóvenes y adultos ante la angustia de los necesitados y de los que sufren. Es importante mencionar que la constitución de mi país reconoce el capítulo de las relaciones internacionales, el principio de la ciudadanía universal. Promueve la paz, el desarme universal, el respeto a los derechos humanos en general y de los migrantes, así como también la cooperación integración y solidaridad. La pandemia del coronavirus, a pesar de lo devastadora, nos trae una gran lección al mundo, que debemos siempre estar unidos y solidarios para poder defender de mejor forma la salud y el milagro de la vida. En definitiva, 
la educación de los ciudadanos globales tiene como finalidad construir un mundo mejor, más pacífico, justo, diverso, fraterno y solidario, humano y sustentable, que es lo que anhelamos todos los seres desde el fondo de nuestras conciencias y corazones. Considero que la solidaridad y la fraternidad de manera integral son la base fundamental para construir y alcanzar la anhelada paz social. Muchas gracias. Thank you, dear Fernando, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, we, are, we are really having very good presentations uh, in, this, uh, in this chapter. And we are very proud of the judges and professors who are uh, working in this panel. Thank you to all of you. The, the last speech is uh, from Peru, uh, Judge Omar Chavez. Uh, we also have a, a very strong relationship with the judiciary of Peru. Uh, we are very proud of the judges of Peru and their role in the democracy. So please, Omar, uh, this is your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, my friend, Josh, Josh Ricardo Lee Rossi. Well, I going to share my screen. Can I? Yes, please. Ah, thank you very much. It doesn't work. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, okay. Okay, namaste. The, my name is Omar Abraham Ahomet Chavez, judge of the Superior Court of Lima, Republic of Peru. My presentation is about the role of the judge in public policies of global education of children. The purpose of, the pres of this presentation is the judges can help improve global education. The objectives of, the, of this purpose are to know and analyze the case law on public policy for global education. Description of the problem. The design of educational public policy is progressive depending on the state budget. However, according with these premises, the question is, how would the judge help to make quality and universal education for children, for all children? This question, uh, the, the answer of this question, I found it in this Peruvian case law. Marlene Ciesa Fernandez and another versus Board of Education of Utcubamba Peruvian Amazon region. This case law was resolved by Constitutional Court of Peru. The file of this case was number 00A53-2050, PA, PA is acronym in Spanish, Proceso de Amparo. In English, that means Judicial Protection to Constitutional Rights. Slash TC, acronym Tribunal Constitucional. In English, Constitutional Court. Case background, the, the, plaintiffs, the plaintiffs were poor peasant women, like this. They requested to the Constitutional Court of Peru the gover that the government allowed them to enroll in a school near their farms. They, uh, they state that where they live, there is no school. It's, it's a poor town. So they forced to study in a school far an hour and a half away from where they live. The Attorney General of the Edu uh, Board, of, uh, or Board of Education replied the lawsuit. He recognized that their current state budget forced the plaintiff to study in a remote school. 
but in the future, probably depending on the budget, the government will build schools near the town in the next few years. But the question is, how many few years? I don't know. And the attorney general, he doesn't know too. Ground of the, of the, of the judgment. The constitutional court, in this case, argued the following points. Education must promote tolerance and friendship among all nations and among, among all racial, ethnic, or religious groups. In other words, the Constitution must promote uh, uh, war peace. Other grounds of the judgment, the Constitutional Court said, education should promote the activities of the United Nations of for the maintenance, maintenance of peace. In other words, the education should promote universal values. Other grounds of the judgment, the Constitutional Court accepted that social rights are progressive depending on the state budget, because that is as, that is that it is thus regulated in the Peruvian Constitution. But this reason not be an excuse for the state to violate social rights. Other grounds, the Constitutional Court said, the progressivity of government spending is, sub is subject to reasonable terms. This progressivity requires a specific and constant action. I repeat that. This progressivity requires a specific and constant action from the state to implement public policies. In this case law, the, member, the members of the Constitutional Court, this is, this, uh, these are the members, declare the unconstitutional state of affairs on the availability and accessibility, accessibility of education to all Peruvians living in extreme poverty. But what is unconstitutional state of affairs? This is a mechanism created by Peruvian case law. It is expressed in that phrase. If the government affects one person, then it affects the entire social group where that person lives. Due to the, according to the unconstitutional state of affairs, the members of the constitutional court awarded the human rights of education to all Peruvian poor people, regardless of whether they are plenties. Because these, poor, these people, poor people, Peruvian poor people, and the plaintiffs are vulnerable. Anal analysis of the case and conclusion of the Constitutional Court. According of the unconstitutional state of affairs, the in this case law, the Constitutional Court required the Minister of Education of Peru to report every six months the implementation of the education plan for all Peruvian children, like you see in this picture, picture or photo. I repeat the question, how would the judge help to make quality and universal education for children? According with this case law, the answer, the answer is, the judge can monitor the quality and implementation of public education policy for all children. This mission can be done through the unconstitutional state of affairs. According with this case law and this answer, by the way, let us remember the wise word of Bin Rao Ranji Amdekar, lawyer order of the Constitution of India. Law and order are the medicine of the body politic. And when the body politic gets sick, medicine must be administered. Dr. B. R. M. Daker. Denjeva, thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Do you hear me now? Yes. yes. Good. Okay.
Uh, what I was, uh, I was saying thank you to Omar for his wonderful presentation and telling you that uh, during this uh, panel, we have uh, very good presentations about the role of education and the role of the judiciary in order to enforce uh, services of education for the society, because that means the future. Uh, so I am very proud of the participants of this uh, panel. I would like to say thank you to Barbara, to Judge Sharam, to Angelica, Andrea, Fernando, and Omar for their wonderful presentations. Uh, and of course to the CMS, uh, because for by this way, you allow us to give our opinions and our points of view of this important topic. Thank you very much.